If I were to ask you, what are you doing here today, what would you say? Um, I just came here to worship God, to hang out with other believers, and just to uh, do life together. If I were to ask you, what are you doing here today, what would you say? Um, fellowship with Christian community and learn truths about the Bible that I wouldn't otherwise probably look up on my own. Coming to worship. Exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. Come into worship with fellow believers and yeah, a safe place for us to come and get to show our love for Jesus in a public way. I'm here for the coffee. Great. Um, I'm volunteering for the first time, so <laughs> yeah. Helping people feel welcome and comfortable. Yeah. Helping people meet and follow Jesus. Worshiping God. Worshiping the Lord. I'm here to further my relationship with God. If I were to ask you, what are you doing here today? What would you say? I'm singing in the youth. <laughs> I'm here to learn about the Lord, to be with the Lord, and to see people that I love and that's part of my family. This is my support system, and this is where I come every week. Hanging out, hanging out with students, help encourage them to uh, meet and follow Jesus. If I were to ask you, what are you doing here today, what oh, would you say? I came to worship and learn and party. <laughs> Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Mike McGill. I'm the creative pastor here, and uh, Roy has just taken a much-needed, deserved weekend off, and so I, would fill, I said I would fill in for him, and he said, don't screw it up, and I said, okay, I'll try. <laughs> just glad to be here with you this morning, and uh, today we're going to be talking about storms, storms in our life. And uh, if you're not in a storm right now, you probably either just came out of one or you're about to go into one. At some point, we're dealing with storms in our life, and so I want to talk about those today. And, you know, while the, while the band was singing that last song, that song talking about our faith to step out on the water and, you know, when the water is raging, it made me think of, uh, made me think of a story in the book of Mark. I don't have it on the screens. I just want you to hear these words. Mark chapter 4, verse 35, it says, As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. <laughs> I love Jesus. He's like, there's a storm going on, but I'm good. I'm going to take a nap. <laughs> the disciples woke him up shouting, teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? And some of you... I've probably been in that boat, no pun intended, saying, God, don't you even care about the situation I'm, I'm in right now? Haven't you seen what I'm dealing with and what I'm, what I'm facing? Don't you care what I'm dealing with right now, God? I know I've spent a few times praying that prayer. When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, silence, be still. And suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. I love that line. Some of you are like, I'm still waiting for that great calm to happen. I've got four kids. I'm still waiting. I don't know. It's going to be at least like 15 years before I feel the great calm. You know, I got time still. Then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? What are you doing here? If God were standing here and asking you that question today, what would you say? Uh, we're here for you. Some of you may be running. Some of you may be hiding. Some of you may be trying to get ready for a storm you're about to face. Some of you are just coming out of a storm and this is your place of reprieve. What are you doing here? That's a question that is asked to a guy that we're gonna talk about here in a couple minutes. Uh, an incredible story that I'm really excited. It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible because uh, it's not something you'd expect. But let me ask you this question before we dive into there. How prepared are you to handle your storm? You may not be one in one right now, but there will be a storm one day. Life happens and storms happen. 
How prepared are you? Are you the one that's going to tuck tail and run? Are you the one waking up Jesus going, whoa, what are you doing? Are you ready to stand boldly in the face of that storm, knowing who's got your back? I want to talk about a guy named Elijah. He was a prophet in the Old Testament. And um, afraid is not a word that I would associate with a guy named Elijah. Elijah, who was a prophet, and back then God used, pro- he used people, he used men to, uh, to be his mouthpiece. He would, he would send these guys to be messengers. He would tell them to go to cities and warn them that the way you're living is not good and, and nothing good is gonna come of it. Change your lives or it's just gonna yield bad consequences. Or sometimes he would have them perform crazy, incredible miracles. In fact, this dude, Elijah, he was, uh, he was at a, a widow's house. She was helping to take care of him and her son passed away. And Elijah prays to God and brings her son back from the dead. Like, he has performed insane miracles. He was bold, he was tough, he was courageous, almost to the point of being cocky. And so when I hear that he was afraid, it's a word that I have a hard time associating with who he is. If you got your Bibles, open up to the book of 1 Kings. We're going to start in the middle of this story, chapter 18, verse 41 through 42. It says, then Elijah said to Ahab, Ahab was the king at that time, go get something to eat and drink for I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. I want you to prepare yourself because there's a storm heading your way. Now for King Ahab, this storm that was coming was a good storm. They had just finished a three-year drought, probably one of the worst droughts they had ever seen. But it was because of their wickedness that they had to go through this drought. So Ahab went to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel, bowed low to the ground, and prayed with his face between his knees. I've never prayed that way before. I was going to show you, but I didn't. I want to be able to stand back up. I can't. Never mind. Storms can represent a whole bunch of different things in our lives family issues, marriage issues, finances. Maybe it's an addiction that you can't figure out how to move on from. Maybe it's health issues, something that you've been struggling with and battling with for a long time. Maybe it's your kids. Maybe it's your workplace. Maybe your boss is just a jerk. Roy, I'm not talking about. That's not. If you're watching, don't watch this one. Maybe it's loneliness or anxiety, depression. I mean, the list goes on and on. There's all kinds of storms that we deal with. Elijah was a guy who we're going to learn about was running from a storm in his life. But I want to back up and and, and preface this story with exactly what's going on and why he told King Ahab to go prepare himself. See, three years prior, God... God warned Elijah, he said, because of their wickedness, because of the people and their disobedience. See, see King Ahab, who was, anointed, who was an anointed king, chosen by God to be the king, the Bible says he was the worst, the most wicked king that Israel had ever seen, worse than all the previous kings before him. He married Jezebel, who worshiped other idols. She worshiped Baal, who was the god of rain and the god of thunder and lightning, And she had all the Israelite, the Hebrew prophets, murdered. Elijah was the only one left. And and he's angry because he's got a fire for God and he's trying to get these people to to listen and, and, and to obey God because he knows what God can do for them. And so finally, after three years of a drought, You know, it's funny, during this drought, God takes care of Elijah. It's so cool in such a unique way. He says, Elijah, I want you to go hang out for a couple years by this little brook, this stream where you'll have water. I'll provide water to flow through there for you. And and, and for food, he's like, don't worry, I've got you covered. He sends ravens twice a day who deliver meat and bread to him. Like... He wakes up, ah, there's a bird sitting there dropping off some meat, like, here you go, see you later. And then again, once in the evening, a, a, a raven drops off food for him. God takes care of his people. 
So finally, Elijah, he's, he's fed up, he's had enough, and he goes to King Ahab and he says, that's it. He says, I want you to gather up all the Israelites, gather up your 450 false prophets for the, for the God of Baal, and let's go up to Mount Carmel and we're gonna duke this thing out once and for all. And they go up there and they have this battle of the gods. He tells him, he's like, here's what I want you to do. I want you to build an altar, and on this altar, put your wood, take a bull and sacrifice it and place the bull on top. I will do the same. And whosoever God will send down fire and light that sacrifice, we know is the one true God. So they say, all right, let's do this. So they go up there and these 450 false prophets, they, they build this, this altar and all the Israelites are gathered around watching. They build this altar, they put their wood on top of it, they sacrifice a bull and they place the bull on top and then they start worshiping and chanting and dancing all day long, the entire day. More adamantly than most Christians, I'd even say. With no response, nothing. So they step it up a notch. They start cutting themselves and spilling their own blood to try and summon this God, Baal, the God of rain, to send fire down upon this altar. Nothing. So Elijah steps up. He says, enough. He says, come here. I want you to gather around. And before their eyes, he rebuilds the altar that they had torn down, the altar to his God, the one true God, Yahweh, did you know Elijah's name in Hebrew is Eliyahu, which means my God is Yahweh? That's awesome. He rebuilds the altar, puts the wood on top, places the bull on top, and then he says, I need you to go get me some water. And they're like, dude, there is no water. And he's like, there's water, go get me some. So they bring him three, three large pitchers of water and he dumps them over the top. He actually dug a trench around the altar and the water spills down over the sacrifice, all over the wood, and it starts filling up the trench. He says, go get me more. They do it again. Fills it, pours it over. Go get me more. And he does it again. Three times he sends them back and he drenches this sacrifice in water, proving that there was no humanly way possible that he could light this thing on fire. And then he starts praying. He says, God... I've done what you told me to do. Prove to these people once and for all that you are the one true God. And down from the skies comes fire. <laughs> that ignites this whole altar on fire. It says it burned up even the rocks and licked up the water that was in the trenches surrounding this altar. Completely consumed. You know what happens? When all the people saw it, they fell face down on the ground and they cried out, the Lord, Yahweh, he is God. Yes, the Lord is God. And Elijah drops the mic and walks away. <laughs> Wait, that's not in there. <laughs> Actually, it gets a little intense. He rounds up, he says to the Israelites, round up those 450 prophets. He takes them down in the valley and he executes every single one of them. Whoa. That just took a turn. That was pretty intense. Elijah was a very intense guy. Not afraid. Not ashamed of who God is and the truth that God has called him to walk in. Look at verse 46. Then the Lord gave special strength to Elijah. He tucked his cloak into his belt and ran ahead of Ahab's chariot all the way to the entrance of Jezreel. See, Elijah just got done telling him, you need to get ready because there's a storm coming. God is now sending the rain to provide for the land. And he said, but if you stay here, you're going to get caught in the storm and you're not going to be able to make it back. And so, so Ahab gets in his chariot, he gets in his Escalade and they start driving back to Jezreel. And, and Elijah is somehow filled with the strength of God, tucks his robe into his belt and sprints 20 miles back to Jezreel, beating Ahab's chariot. No big deal. When Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel, who actually wore the pants in the relationship, sent this message to Elijah. May the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not 
killed you just as you killed them. So here's where it takes a turn. Because it's one of the most peculiar verses in the Bible because after what we just read, right, you have this, this man, Elijah, who's just on fire for God and he gets one death threat from the queen. And look at, look at verse three. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. What? This is the same dude that just called fire down from heaven. Why is he, why is he running from her? He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and, there, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord. You ever been to that point? Enough, God. I, I, I can't. I can't do this anymore. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Elijah runs from the place God had positioned him. You know, I was reading this story and studying it, preparing this message, and my own personal opinion, I don't think Elijah was afraid of Jezebel. Yes, he ran for his life. Yes, he fled. But I don't think he was running for his life. I think he was running from his life. I think Elijah was tired of dealing with storms and didn't want to deal with another one. And maybe you're there. Maybe you're in that position. Maybe you've had enough storms and you're saying, enough, God. There's three things that God says to Elijah. And, 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 and Elijah is, you know, he's one of those characters in the Bible, along with many other characters in the Bible, who I wouldn't necessarily associate with being fearless. And that's what I've come to learn is that, is that God doesn't use people who are fearless, right? We, we may think that, we may look at all the different characters in the Bible because what God uses people in the Bible for are incredible, mighty, huge things. And it's easy to associate them with being just, they were just brave. But I've come to learn that God doesn't use people who are fearless, but they are faithful. They're faithful. Despite their screw-ups, despite their shortcomings, despite how many times they say, I don't want to do it, God. Moses, one of God's right-hand guys who God used in incredible ways. He argued with God over and over and over again. God, I don't want to do this. I'm not a good communicator. Don't send me. Send somebody else. And God says, no, 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 I'll be with you. You got this. I think Elijah's in that same position. He's like, I can't, I can't do another storm, God. And so there's three things I think that God says to Elijah Let's keep reading. If you've got your Bible, look at, uh, we're in 1 Kings chapter 19, look at verse 5. It says, then he laid down and slept under the broom tree, but as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. He looked around and there beside his head was some baked bread on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Some of you may be looking for like a life verse. That's it right there. So he ate, drank, and lay down again. Done. That's my life verse. I'm going to tattoo that on my arm. I'm going to write it everywhere I go. Hey, the Lord said it. He ate, drank, and lay down again. That's the story of my life. Verse 7, then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, get up and eat some more, or the journey ahead will be, much, will be too much for you. The first thing that God says to Elijah that I think he's saying to you and I is get up and eat. You need to replenish yourself. You need to nourish yourself because where you're going, what I want you to do, you, you need strength for it. And I want to provide that for you. He's saying, I want you to be brave enough for me, but... If you don't, if you're not feeding yourself, 
if you're not nourishing yourself by the food that God has put right at your fingertips, the journey is going to be too much for you. You can't walk in courage if your courage is malnourished. If you've got a smartphone, do me a favor, pull it out, just hold, just hold it up. Let me see all the smartphones in the room. Most, most all of us, right? You know what these things are capable of doing? Crazy things. There are, are Bible apps now that have translations in almost every language of the world. Different versions, different scriptures. Put a Bible app on your phone. Set a reminder to, to get into God's word every day. version is a great app. I, I, that's the one I use. And at a bare bones minimum, I at least look at the verse of the day because it's good. It's food. I'm filling my life with food and it fills me with courage because then I'm, I'm nourished. I can't walk encouraged if I'm malnourished. Feed yourselves. Meditate on his word day and night. That's what it says. Here's the beauty of it, right? Elijah's on the run. He's running from Jezebel. He's running from the storm. He doesn't want to deal with this. He's running from his life. He's running from the place God had positioned him because he was afraid. And what does God do? He doesn't shame him. He doesn't go, what, what are you doing here, you moron? Haven't you seen all the big things I've done for you? Haven't you seen the miracles? You just called fire down from heaven. What are you doing here? He says, you need to eat. You need to feed yourself. See, God loves you and I enough to provide food on our path even when we're running from him. Even when we're saying, enough, God, I'm out. I don't want to do it anymore. And we start running. He says, that's okay. I know. I get it. You're tired. I'm going to provide food for you because you need, your courage needs to be nourished. Feed your faith and fear won't stand a chance. Are you feeding your faith? Are you spending time in his word, building a relationship with him? We receive God's power to be courageous by consuming his promises. Let's keep reading. Look at verse 8. So he got up, he ate and drank, and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. There he came to a cave where he spent... Now, you know, you might be thinking, well, that's really good. He, he, came to, he went to the mountain of God. He ran about 200 miles south of where God wanted him. He may have gone to Mount Sinai, and Mount Sinai is the place where God descended on and gave the, the law. He gave the Ten Commandments to Moses. This was called the mountain of God because that's where God came down, and that's where Elijah runs to. And, that, and it sounds like it's a really good thing, but he's still running from God, and he goes up this mountain, and he hides in a cave. where he spent the night, but the Lord said to him, what are you doing here? Now, what I like about this question is that it could be asked in different ways, right? You could ask that question to anybody, either with excitement, like you're glad to see them, like, oh, what are you doing here? Or with regret, what are you doing here? Or what are you doing here? Or what? are you doing here? And I think God's question to Elijah was, what are you doing here? Like, how'd you get here? I, I need you up there. I need you where I've positioned you and you, you're all the way down here. I need you north and you've ran south. What are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah responds, he says, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord said. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by. 
I love this part. And a mighty windstorm hit the mountain, but it was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said, what are you doing here? What are you doing here, Elijah? Why are you running from me? Why are you trying to hide in darkness from what I want for you? Don't you trust me? You ever heard that whisper before? What are you doing here? The second thing God told Elijah was to go out and stand. He says, go out and stand because I want you out of the cave. The cave is dark and nothing good happens in the darkness. The darkness is where the devil grows evil and wicked and he shouts lies at you. And the dark is where you're blind and you can't see where you're going. He wants to keep you there. Darkness in scripture represents ignorance. He wants to keep you as ignorant as you possibly can be so that he can stand there from a distance and shout lies in your direction. You're not good enough. You can't handle this. Your kids are out of control. Your finances are a wreck. You'll never get over this addiction. Just give in. And he's going to shout lies over and over and over and over at you while you wait there in the darkness. But God is going to call you into the light, out of the cave. Get out of that darkness and come stand before me. I want to show you something. You know why God whispers, right? What does somebody have to do in order to whisper to you? They whisper because they're close. So close to you. Even while you're running from God, he's close to you. He's gonna provide for you. He's gonna call you out into the light. He's not done with you yet. And I was reading this, and I'm like, okay, yeah, I get that, God, but like, can't you just come like pass by me? I want to see that. I want to see the, the grandeur, the mighty power of God. I want to see the, the mountain shake, and I want to see wind hit it so hard that the rocks are crumbling and fire strike the mountain so bad that it burns. But God's not going to pass by us. That's Old Testament. That's before Jesus. See, when Jesus came and what he did for you and I, he was, he, it allowed him to usher in uh, to us his presence, his spirit. In fact, he told his disciples, he says, I, I'm, I'm leaving you with a gift. I'm leaving you with my presence, who I am, my spirit is, is with you. And not only is it going to be around you or near you or close by, he says, it will be in you. The power of God is in you. He doesn't need to pass by anymore because he dwells within you. You are capable of mighty things in his name. I think for Elijah, you know, he had, he had seen those big moments. He just got done calling fire down from heaven. He, he doesn't need God to show him that he exists in fire. And I think God is telling him that 
even beyond those big moments in your life, whether it's a good storm or a bad storm, I'm still here. I'm still close, close enough to whisper into your ear. Some of you are, are in a storm this morning. And I'm sorry for that. We have to deal with a lot of muck in this world. But you need to know that our God who loves us is close enough to you that he's whispering in your ear. Trust me. Let me handle the storm. Let me calm the storm for you so that you can experience peace. But we play tug of war sometimes, right? We don't want to let go because we think we can do it on our own. Let's jump down to verse 15. Then the Lord told him, I want you to go back the same way you came and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, I want you to anoint Hazael to be king of Aram, then anoint Jehu, grandson of Nimshi, to be the king of Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from the town of Abba Mohola, to replace you as my prophet. Anyone who escapes from Hazael will be killed by Jehu. Those who escape Jehu will be killed by Elisha. Yet I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who have never bowed down to Baal or kissed him. Get up and eat. Go out and stand. And he says, I I want you to get back to work. I got work for you to do. I need you to go back from where you came. But but here's the good news. He says, because while, while you were in the cave, while you were hiding in darkness from me, I've made plans for you. He's like, I just... I just made plans to take care of your enemies and I just set up retirement for you as well. You're welcome. So what are you gonna do? Are you gonna sit here and cower in the cave not wanting to face your storm? Or are you gonna get up and eat, go out and stand before me and get back to work? Because that's what he's calling you to do. He has things to show you that you have not yet seen that will blow your mind if you will trust him, if you will nourish yourselves and and feed your courage by his power, by his word. He has plans for your life. I want to jump back to that story of the storm. It's in Mark chapter 4. So he calms the storm, right? Disciples are terrified. They're, they're afraid for their lives. They think they're going to drown. He calms the storm, and he's like, Where, where's your faith? Why are you here? What are you doing here? Didn't you trust me? And then look at verse 41. This is after the storm has been calmed. It's already passed. And verse 41 says, the disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other that even the wind and waves obey him. See, I think that when we position ourselves to allow God to work on our, on our behalf, we will go from being afraid of the storm that we're facing to being filled with the fear of the Lord. They went from being afraid of the storm to being filled with the fear of the Lord and and not fear of the Lord as in like, oh, don't hurt us, don't kill us, but whoa. You're a lot bigger than I thought you were. You're a lot stronger than I thought you were. You are more capable than I ever could imagine. When was the last time you were filled with awe of who God is? there's one thing that you leave here today with, it's this. 
We don't have to fear what we face. We don't have to be afraid of that storm that we're staring at going, how am I ever going to get through this? When we know who we trust in. Jesus is the storm tamer. But sometimes we have to experience the storm in order to receive the calm after it. But only by the power of Jesus. Let's pray. God, thank you for being bigger than the storm. Jesus, you outrank the storm. And so we trust you. We choose today, Lord, to, to, to get up and eat, to spend time in your word, to fill ourselves, to feed our courage so that it is nourished and full and satisfied so that we can go out and stand before you and then get back to work and allow you to show us things in our life that we have yet to see. Thank you for loving us when we don't deserve it. Thank you for feeding us even while we run from you. You are good to us. We praise your name for that. God, whatever storm people are experiencing in this room this morning, Lord, I pray that in the name of Jesus, you would calm those storms. That they can experience a moment of peace so they can step out from the cave where the devil can't shout lies at them anymore. We love you, we praise you, we worship you in Jesus' name, amen.